So first of all, welcome to the uh, first session of Tuesday. It's the second day of NDC. Certainly very happy to be back here. I am uh, Claire Novotny. I'm a program manager. Now they're calling us product managers at Microsoft on the NuGet team. So how many of you are familiar with NuGet? Most of you? Fantastic. Um, you're all, I assume, mostly .NET developers since you're here. That's great. Thank you for using .NET. Certainly like that, and it's my favorite framework. Um, in this talk, we're going to start with a basic library. We're going to um, validate that we don't have any breaking changes across versions. We're going to turn it into a package following some of our best practices that we recommend, add some automatic versioning, add some multi-targeting, and you know, then we'll move on to talk about supply chain security and how NuGet helps you improve that and make things more secure and better. So at the end, we'll have plenty of time for some Q&A. So if you have some burning questions, please um, ask them. And I'll be here both you know, after and later today as well and at the party this evening. So if you have questions about NuGet or other things around .NET, please send them my way. And if I don't know the answer, I will certainly be happy to connect you with my colleagues that do know the answer. So with that, let's uh, get started. So how many of you um, create or maintain a NuGet package? And is this for internal use? Open source? OK, good mix. How about consuming packages? OK, that's OK, most of you here. And do you, share, do you share code with other teams in your company or clients using NuGet? So stuff that's not going to the public, but you know, we want to do some reuse. Good, good. All right. This is a very different answer than it would have been you know, five years ago and four years ago when people were doing all kinds of other weird forms of sharing, like you know, copying files around that then would have to be updated. How many of you are familiar with multi-targeting? OK, so good. We'll, we'll come back to that one. Um, and for those of you that are using multi-targeting, why are some of the reasons you're using it? Just shout. OK. All right, very good. So we have a number of best practices on, at NuGet that we've been recommending for a while, although you know, we certainly get questions about this all the time. And we've been introducing new features over the years as well to help improve privacy and security and safety uh, as well. So package icon is a relatively new thing. It's you know, about a year, year and a half old, which allows you to embed a package icon in your package rather than referencing it from a file. And that sounds trivial, but the reason you care, especially as a consumer, is that every time you reference a file on the internet, you have to retrieve it, which then yields your IP address and potentially information to third parties. That's a privacy leak. So at NuGet, we are encouraging folks to use icons in the package. And for those that are coming from NuGet.org, we will proxy those icons from third parties if they are there. So we're trying to protect your privacy there. Uh, README. How many folks have a README in their package? A few. OK. How many of you would like to have a README in the packages you use? OK, yeah, yeah. Well, so this is a feature where you can authors can put a README in the package, which will then be available anywhere the package is, offline and such. And that, so you can get, make it easier to get started. License information, certainly a crucial bit. Um, if it doesn't have a license, you can't really use it. It doesn't, it's ambiguous, right? So you have to know what the license is. And NuGet allows you to do that. So we're going to make sure we do that correctly. Uh, symbols and source link are, again, somewhat more recent. But how many folks are trying to debug something in production and saying, hey, look, um, I don't know where that came from, or I'm trying to step into some code. All right. And did you have symbols for it in, some, in all cases? Sometimes? Would you wish you did? Especially if it's an open source library, and you're like, I know the code is there on GitHub. Why can't I step into it? So having the symbols along with source link allows you on the debugger to automatically locate that source code, download it, and step into it at debug time. And more recently, as of Visual Studio 2022, 
one, I want to say, the latest one, allows you to navigate there in the editor as well. So if you control click a file, or you know, shift F5, or no, shift, anyway, you go to the definition, it will download the symbols, locate the source, and step into the code directly to make it easier to just navigate those third-party code. And we'll show you how to do that here in momentarily. So let's um, switch over to Visual Studio and create a package. And I'm using Visual Studio 2022, 17.2 preview, I don't know, six, the latest one. And we're just gonna come here and create a new package, oh, new project, there we go. And I'm just gonna create a basic class library, cool. And let's just call it NDC London. Because, you know, that's where we are. I'm going to pick .NET 6. It's the latest long-term support, which means it's supported for three years. .NET 7 is coming out later this year. It is a short-term support, but the quality is the same. There's no difference in quality. It's just supported until the next major long-term support comes out. So definitely encourage you to use the latest version if you can. So I'm going to come in here, and let's go and create this package. I'm going to add an icon to it, and the first thing I'm going to do is just drag this lovely tulip, because I like tulips. I was just in Amsterdam earlier in April and saw the amazing tulip fields, so I like tulips as icons. But putting it into Visual Studio here is not enough to get it into the package, so instead, I'm going to come in here, oh, hit Properties, and here we go. Any of you seen the new properties page yet in Visual Studio? You know you can search. So I can come in here and say, I don't really know where this icon is. Uh, I'm gonna come in here and find it. And here we go. If it moves. Oh, there we go. Browse, and I'm gonna go find this thing on the disk. Oh. Big icon, big dialogues make it harder to navigate. Here we go, dev, NDC London. And we're gonna select the tulip. With that, we should be good once it decides to put it there. There's also all kinds of other items here, so you can certainly search for the rest of your properties and edit this a lot more easily than you could before, and it shows you a lot of the defaults that you may have not realized you could change. So I'm not gonna go into all of that here, but you can certainly poke around and see all the package-related items here. Um, the one thing I will add is we'll go to the license. Let's set that to, say, SPDX. And uh, SPD, how many folks are familiar with SPDX? So it's just four weird, weird letters. Um, SPDX is a industry-wide uh, set of abbreviations for the most common license types. So instead of having to embed a text file of MIT or Apache or whatever, it's saying, hey, look, we know these are the most common things. Let's just put the word MIT in there, and we'll recognize the expression. Um, it can get much more complicated in terms of, you know, Booleans and whatnot, but this allows machines to read this thing and make decisions on what your package has for compliance reasons. So we're gonna set that here, hit save, and we can look here at the properties page and see exactly what it did. Because I don't know about you, but I like the UI sometimes if I'm learning, but when I wanna know how something works, I'm going to go straight to the project file. And come in here, hit edit project file, and we can see here that it added this item, which really just tells it, hey, look, we're going to include this file in the package at this location, and it's at the package icon property to, you know, the name of the file. So this will be there, and if we build this package and hit pack, it will build this here. And in a moment, we can pull this up in NuGet Package Explorer and take a look at this lovely package we have so far. Copy this here. 
How many folks have, are familiar with NuGet Package Explorer? Few? So for those that are less familiar, NuGet Package Explorer is a program that allows you to inspect NuGet packages, as the name implies. And it also will tell you whether you're following the best practices there as well. So if I pull this up, double click, come on, open. It's thinking. All right. There we go. NuGet Package Explorer is both a Windows desktop application and a website more recently, as of last summer. So if you go to NuGet.info, you can get this in WebAssembly and it will work everywhere. So if you're using a Mac or your phone, it will work there. Now, it will, it's not optimized for mobile screen sizes currently, but it still loads and you can run it there. So if you see this package, we see here that it has the tulip icon, but we're missing symbols and it says, you know, we're getting a whole bunch of red. And what that's telling us here is that there are missing steps in order to make this package be able to be debuggable and reproducible and validatable by other systems. Now, instead of having to go fiddle with a whole bunch of different properties, which you certainly can do, we've made it easier, the .NET Foundation has made it easier to just add a package reference to uh, reproducible builds and it will do all of the stuff for you instead of having to you know, set this stuff manually. So if I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna to go to the package manager UI and we're gonna go search for .NET.reproducible builds. And don't worry about the names, this slide deck is available, the QR code is at the front and it will be on screen later so don't have to worry about memorizing any of this stuff. But we had install and it adds a reference to this package which is a build time reference. It doesn't need any, it doesn't take any dependencies on your application at runtime at all. And now if we rebuild this and we look at the result again, as soon as it finishes, there we go. we will get some green checkboxes instead of red ones. Here we go. Oh, why did it not like that? Let's try this one more time. Clean, rebuild. Rebuild. Let's do this one more time. Oh, I did build instead of pack, that's why. It doesn't help if I build it and don't actually tell it to create the package. It won't get very far. Here we go. And it is telling me here that we have compiler flags and has symbols and no source link. The reason for that is it's hard to add source information if we are not in a repository. So let's go do that. So I'm gonna come in here and I don't know how many folks have seen this in, Git, in Visual Studio. I mean, it's a big product. We've been adding a lot of features. I can just turn this into a Git repository right here. I don't have to go into a command line or anything else. Let's come in, I'm gonna add a Git just use the existing template. I'm gonna have it use the MIT license. Let me check the box. Let me give it a readme file because I want one of those too. And I'm gonna call this thing NDC London because that's what it is. So now we have a Git repository. And one more time, we are going to just rebuild this and pack it. comes back, come on, pack. Really wish there was a keyboard shortcut for pack instead of having to get it. On the other hand, most of the time you're doing this in CI, I hope, right? Anyone still building and right click publish from Visual Studio? Good answer. That being no one. That's my kind of crowd. Either Hopefully it's either you know, GitHub Actions or Azure DevOps or something like that. So here we go and we have a different option and it's just saying, hey, there are some files in here we don't know about and that's okay. It's getting better and if it's on your CI server, this will all be green. There are certain kinds of things that work um, on CI that do not work in the local environment and this is one of them. So take my word for it, add this package, run it in CI, this will all be green. So 
that. Um, how many folks here have um, familiar with package validation? Nobody. All right. So you came to the right talk, because that is one of my most favorite features that we added in .NET 6 that nobody seems to know about yet. And it was blogged about. So I'm going to come in here and uh, turn on package validation, because we're going to want that later. So let me set this property here to true. Enable package out. And we'll come back to that. Yep. There we go. Click. All right. So cross platform compatibility has become a mainstream requirement for .NET library authors. However, we haven't had tooling to help you make this you know, easier in your project. So you know, it's easy to miss emerging platforms, especially if it's not one you regularly use. I mean, how many folks are testing things for, say, Alpine Linux, even if you're building a Linux container? Maybe not everyone. Maybe you are. Maybe are you testing your thing on the latest IoT device? Maybe there's another runtime somewhere that there's a, a native interop that you might need. There's a lot of scenarios that you may not be testing because testing is expensive. And while we're all trying to test the most common cases, it's easy to miss the edge cases. So there's a number of issues that can come up across in package versions. There could be breaking changes. It could be accidental. You didn't mean to break it. But there's a difference between source compatibility and binary compatibility. And it's easy to miss in a just local dev environment because you hit compile. It works. I mean, we expect it to run. I mean, after all, you know, we're not using JavaScript. When C Sharp says it compiles, we, we tend to believe it, right? So other options or other issues might be mismatches between the public API and an implementation API. So if you're doing any form of native interop, you might have seen some packages have this you know, libs and runtimes directories in them. That's because they might need slightly different internal implementations if they're accessing libraries that are specific and native to the device. Geolocation is a great example. On phones, each operating system has a different way to do it. There's other similar things with cryptography and other many scenarios which have different implementations inside, but we need to make sure that the public surface area is the same, or we might get a runtime exception when the, it doesn't match up. Incompatibilities across TFMs is another one that is easy to sometimes overlook. So suppose we need to target net standard 2.0, which is the common, least common denominator right now across all supported .NET platforms. And we want to add additional capabilities that light up with, say, .NET 6, such as support for uh, string optimized uh, overloads to minimize allocations. You might do this for performance reasons. There are many ways to do this. And if you use an if def, for example, you might have an issue in some cases. And we'll come back to that, because that read-only uh, read span of char method that's the super cool fast one might be there for .NET 6. And it might say, do something with a string for .NET standard. If they're not both there, you might have something that is built against the .NET standard version expecting a string. And now at runtime, it gets the .NET 6 version. And oops, not there. So what can we do here? So package validation, as the name implies, helps make sure your package is correct. And will flag you of things that it, like these that it will find. So you, one of them is a baseline version. You can specify a baseline version of a package and say, hey, look, if here's the thing to compare against, make sure that what I'm working on now has, you know, is compatible with it, and let me know if it doesn't. Compatible runtime, again, as the name implies, helps make sure all of the runtime implementations, the public surface area matches across versions. And compatible framework does a similar thing across compatible TFMs. 
So it's aware of the TFM rules, the target frameworks, and it makes sure that, for example, that .NET Standard 2.0 ones exist in a .NET 6 one, but if you have something other like a, a Xamarin one, it won't try and do the wrong kind of comparison. It's aware of what should run everywhere. So let's take a look at how this works with um, a baseline version to see how this can help us uh, avoid some problematic changes. So let's come back and here we go. Alrighty, so what is it doing? Package validation. So in this case, suppose we wanted to add that overload that we talked about, right? So we're saying, hey, look, I have do something with a string, and on .NET 6 or later, I want to use this new fancy overload method here. Um, is this going to work? Well, you know, we build it. It's going to run. We can build. You know, cool. It builds, and you know, we could say, let's move on. But we're smarter than that. We're going to turn on the baseline version checking, and Let's say that you know, we've already built, we've published the 1.0 version somewhere. It could be our private GitHub repository, or private you know, NuGet feed. It could be NuGet.org. Now, I'm going to say, you know, now we're working on version 2. It doesn't matter, different version. I'm going to say, hey, we're comparing against version 1. And now, if I hit pack, we're going to see some differences. Um, Let's try rebuilding that. There we go. Pack. Okay. That was just working. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, it would also help if I used the right demo. <laughs> So, all right, we're going to come in here and uh, say that this is the uh, connect method with a string overload, another common case. So I'm going to come in here, and we're going to add here a, um, that was my next demo, by the way. Uh, we'll come back to that one. We're going to come here and add a parameter. And I think Visual Studio is being slow today. All right, conference Wi-Fi. Let's just blame it on that. Um, let's add a overload in here. This will be something that is source compatible um, and not necessarily uh, binary compatible. So let's come in here. Let's add a time span. Or there we go. Does a time span. You know, timeout. Default. Like that. If I can type. All right. Now, this time we'll see a difference, I promise. And it's making me a liar. <laughs> that is correct. For the win. Thank you. All right. The, adding the old one was the correct solution to this problem. It would help if the, um, we reproduce the issue, as you might do accidentally. So in this case, um, we see here that, and I will zoom in here on this message, that the, there's a method here, the connect string, that exists on the baseline that does not exist here on the net six version, in this current one. And that's because we added something that is source compatible, but a binary breaking change. And as we've demonstrated previously, reverting that and adding the correct overload will solve the problem and you will not have an error. Oh, there's a question here. Yes. Uh, where does the system take the 1.0 uh, reference? How does it know what it was before? Since here you have only the source code for the 6.0. So the question here is, how does the validator know where it locates the prior version from? And the answer is it's going to follow the same NuGet config versions that are already there for your solution. So just like you would add or change a package version in your solution, it's just pulling that down from 
wherever the search paths are leading it. So, the question here is, will it prioritize the local cache? Uh, yes, it will. So if it's already on your disk, it will locate it there. And in this case, for example, I have a local package folder. This isn't a package. It's actually on NuGet.org. And it still works because it's locating it there. OK. So multi-targeting. Wow, the computer is extra slow today. So. How many folks have seen the Frameworks tab on NuGet.org? Anyone? A few people? OK. So this was a top ask, saying, look, I'm adding a package. I want to know if it makes sure it works on my machine. And how do I know what's in there? And we've added a feature to NuGet.org that helps you display the, all the frameworks that it supports to save you some trouble. And we'll take a look at that in a moment. But for multi-targeting itself, we've already talked about some of the reasons you might want to do it. And some of them might be programs that need uh, to run on multiple platforms and need to take advantage of native underlying uh, cryptography primitives. Net standard 2.0, um, it is the most common, lowest common denominator. That said, it's stuck at a level from several years ago, and it is not going to have all of the latest APIs. So net standard 2.0 is great. If you have the functionality you want and need in it, please use it. But don't be constrained by it if, it's, if you want to go beyond it. It also allows you to have different dependencies on different target platforms. So there might be some cases where you might need one set of dependent packages for you know, net framework, but others for .NET 6. And if you're using only .NET standard 2.0, you won't be able to separate the two out. So there are different reasons to do, different ways to do that. And as we've discussed, it's critical that the public surface area is compatible here, because otherwise, we're going to get mismatches at runtime. And we can kind of show that here in the other demo that I was showing. There we go. And we're going to come back here. And. All right, spinning. I have four instances of Visual Studio open, and uh, I don't think it likes my machine very much. All right. So I'm going to come in here. Let is enable package validation. It is thinking. I don't, it's a, it doesn't like Tuesday morning, does it? All right. So we've already looked at some of the code. That was the one here that you know, we might simply say, look, we're going to do this. We're going to target net standard 2.0. And we're going to add some fancy schmancy new way for .NET 6. We're going to ship this. And a customer is going to come in and say, um, why isn't this working? I'm getting all these weird runtime exceptions. And we can prevent that simply by turning this package validation on. And now this time, when I build and pack this project, we will again see that it is going to catch this for us. And OK, here, as promised, we have here, it's thinking, come on, an error. And it's telling us that, hey, again, this method here is on the net standard version, but not on the Net6 version. So it's similar to the baseline comparison, except it's across compatible target frameworks. Here we go. And the solution here to this is add a method overload. So instead of doing an if def, let's just have both on the Net6 version. So I'm going to come in here and say, hey, look, um, let's just get rid of this else, turn this into an end if, and now I hit pack. It will be successful because on the net standard version, it only has the string version, and on the net six version, it has both. So something that is built and linked essentially against the net standard version will continue to use the less optimized implementation. However, it will still run, and you won't have runtime exceptions.
All right, PowerPoint, thank you. Okay. That's, um, <laughs> it really doesn't like me today. How does it? All right, come on. Um, all right, moving on. Click. All right, versioning. This is an area where we've gotten a lot of questions in the past. I've certainly heard this on the internet, on Twitter. It's people asking, you know, hey, look, we're doing continuous integration, continuous delivery. That's cool, but you know, how do I make sure that all the versions are unique? Because if I have them in the project file like that, that means every time someone commits, I have to increment it, and that's kind of silly. That's a lot of noise. Or you know, you might have different ways of doing that with, say, scripts that run in different branches or different ways of using uh, variables on your build server. Some of you, the tags are a common popular way of saying, let's do a major minor that way. So there's a lot of opinions uh, on the internet. Surprise, surprise. Um, at NuGet, we have a view that we want and value immutability and reproducibility most of all above everything else. That's to say that in the future, say three years from now on a different build server in a different environment, I want to be able to check out a particular commit, build it, and have a byte for byte equal version of that file, including all the file versions, including all the hashes and checksums. That makes it easier to validate that it doesn't contain malicious code. And it makes sure that you know, it's not doing funny things along the way. So we, in order to do that, um, we can't use tags, because tags can be changed. You might say, I made a mistake. Let me say, update it to a different commit. And three years from now, there's no guarantee that that tag is going to be the same. And if your version is based on that, it won't be a reproducible build. Same thing with environment variables or build. I mean, that's just a given, right? It's different build server, different process. No, all bets are off. So the one we recommend is something called nerdbank.git versioning. It is a project that's a member of the .NET Foundation. And the project shares a similar mindset where it is aiming for complete immutability and reproducibility. And it does that by maintaining a version file in the repository. So you don't have to increment it on every commit, but you do have to touch it on a major minor. And that's OK. At least you know, that's a reasonable compromise that we see where if I'm working on 1.1, that's cool. I'll get 1.1. whatever. And then later, I can change, hey, I want to ship 2.0. At some point, I just have a step that says, let's release 2.0, set the version, and move on. And it supports pre-release tags as well. So let's take a look at how this can work. So we're going to come back here to our library. And I can close this one. Maybe it will free up some resources. Go away. Come on. Go away. All right, come back to the command line. DC London. So their bank get versioning is available as a NuGet package. It also works as a global command, which saves you some steps to install it in your project. So if I come in here and I can do um, the install step. So come back here. Um, all right. We do. This is really it's thinking about switching to a directory. I don't know what's going on today. All right. So let's commit the previous changes. Get a message. It. That's from when we added the repository. Let's just move on. And let's go ahead here and add nbgv. 
inst oh, NBGV install. And this will come in here and add the files and reference that you need in your project. So we come in here and it's thinking as is, seems to be the mode of the day. And we're gonna come back here to our project and see what it did. So we're gonna come here and rebuild this. And we should see here momentarily that it added a version. So we come in here, let's come in, let's open the package. And it should be version 1.0. I don't know, something. Because you don't really know, and I've stopped caring. And a lot of people have strong preferences. They want to release a 1.0.0. .0 or I think that a lot of people put too much emphasis on that last point. Nobody really pays attention to it. And if you look at other ecosystems like Node and NPM, there are all kinds of crazy versions anyway. So don't worry about it. Um, so let's come in here. And let's take a look at what it added. So we come in here and look at the version JSON. It added here. Um, here we go. Open it up in this other window, grab it. All right, so saying 1.0, I'm gonna come in here, we're using main as a branch spec, and let's commit this, because it's not gonna do much until it's committed, so it has to have a starting version to go on. Okay, get A, get commit M version, Cool. Now we should have here a version. And it does this by adding a file to all of the projects in the solution. So if we come back in here, we'll see that it has a uh, directory.build.props. So if I open this up, there we go. adds a file to the root of the directory that allows you to say, add stuff and properties to all projects underneath it. How many folks have seen directory.build.props or targets? Some of you, okay. So that's a neat trick. There's a lot more online about that, but it's certainly if there's common things, especially if you have packages or you know, icons and other such things, don't repeat yourself. That's a way of refactoring common MS build settings, whether it's references or anything else, into a common location. So um, that's been supported there for many years, but most a lot of people just don't know about it, so there's a tip. It adds this in here, so let's go ahead and build this now. We should get a version, and here we go. This time, six. Wait, that's the wrong. I did build, didn't I? <laughs> Let's pack this. Go. All right. I'm going to move on. It does increment automatically. But we can see that by looking at different commands. So if I come in here, I can do the uh, view commands. If I want to say, like, what information is in here, um, I can come in and say, like, nbgv.getVersion. Thanks. Yes, paste. And it's going to tell me that the version I calculated here is 1.0.1, .1, and that it has different versions, like here's the version in .NET, Here's the assembly version because we want to make sure that we're not, you know, incrementing things too much for .NET Framework where assembly binding is more strict. And because it is a pre-release tag, it calculates a bunch of other stuff here. Now, that's neat, but suppose I want to do something more with it, like in a build script. I want something that's machine parsable. I can say here, format, JSON, and we'll get a lot more information. 
And this is really cool. If you pipe this into PowerShell, which can support pulling in JSON objects natively and use a dot notation to directly access any of this data, when run on a build server, it can set environment variables. So there's lots of different ways of getting to this um, in your various build environment. So there's lots of stuff calculated, um, and there's configurable. More documentation is online. Git hashes, timestamps, height, branches. All of this is available. So if you want to stamp in the branch name into your binary, you can do that with this. So a um, lot very powerful tool and is recommended. All right. Supply chain. So supply chain security is a huge topic. Um, it's a whole other talk, really. It's many other talks over many hours, and I highly recommend that you spend some time uh, examining that. What we're going to do here is a bit of a crash course. The key points are that the attackers are becoming increasingly sophisticated. They are targeting dependencies, open source projects, small companies. There's nothing too small for attackers to target because they are looking for any way into other organizations. So, you know, don't think that, hey, look, we're a two-person shop. Nobody's going to care about us. Um, that's not true anymore. Maybe it was a few years ago, but right now, these days, everyone needs to think about where their dependencies are coming from, how are they getting built, and make sure that they are not the next entry point. I don't think anyone wants to see their name on this list. Um, these are some more common of the infamous attacks, including one from 2021, uh, on dependency confusion in which the same package might exist in multiple feed sources. And if you have conflicting names, it may not be clear which location it's being pulled from. So you might get like an interception there. So another way to look at it is that, you know, we're getting code, you know, off the internet. We don't really know who wrote it. I mean, some person in GitHub with some handle that you know, people like, you know, are we really reading all that code? I mean, OpenSSL kind of proves otherwise with Heartbleed, right? I mean, it was open source. Why didn't anybody see it? It's a very popular cryptography library, but years and years and had massive flaws. It runs as you on your machine. And that's not just PowerShell scripts. Any DLL, any .NET DLL has a module initializer that runs automatically on load doesn't have to even, you don't even know it's there necessarily unless you are looking for it. So there are ways that you can run stuff and you have to make sure you trust the sources. I mean, it's kind of surprising that it's still working, quite honestly. So what is NuGet doing to help improve the story here? Um, package source mapping is a feature we released last fall. And that's a way to mitigate that dependency confusion attack known as SAMHSA. It lets you specify a config file, which, you know, in your NuGet config, what packages are coming from what source. So suppose you have, you know, contoso.something, and you have internal packages in particular that are coming from, you know, your corporate feed. Well, before this, if you, someone else was to say, upload contoso.something to nuget.org, it might be a 50-50 chance. Which one's going to come? You're going to get the one from the internal feed or this one from an attacker on nuget.org? Well, I don't like those odds. So we did something about that. So we released a, a feature called source mapping. And more recently, we have a preview of a tool that allows you to uh, generate those config files for you because it can be a pain to get started. So this is on our blog, on the NuGet blog. Um, but if I come back here to uh, the terminal and it decides to load, I'm going to come back. All right. I'm going to go here to an example here uh, to NuGet Package Explorer. Um, source code, it's open source. You like it? Please submit contributions. Um, I'm going to run here the command that will generate this initial file for you. And that is just package source mapper. I've already installed the tool. Here we go. 
and it's going to generate a config file looking at where things are coming from today and saying, all right, assume this is correct, let's stop it going forward. And you can review this, of course, and edit it. So it's looking at the current config. And we'll generate this file here in a moment. Um, as soon as it does. There we go. So if I come in here, I can, we can take a look. Uh, there we go. There we go. Wait. Let's see what it generated. You get package source mapping. The, uh, there you go. Too many things to start with NuGet in this project. Most of you probably don't have too many files to start with NuGet. In any event, this is a list. This is you can paste this into your NuGet config instead of the existing package sources. And um, it will tell you where all these things are coming from. This project has a lot of dependencies, but it also has several different sources. Um, some stuff is coming from that private feed. Some stuff is coming from another private feed. And the rest are coming from NuGet.org. This, this is a mapping. The existing, this is a preview tool. It can be made better. There could be some wild cards here, but it's a starting and some a starting point that you don't have to do by hand. Yes, there's a question. Uh, which version of NuGet supports this? So that question is what version of NuGet supports this? I believe that is in version six and higher. So that is the one there. Um, NuGet, you can always use the latest tools against older projects. So I highly recommend always using the latest tool chain for security and feature reasons. Package signing is a technique where you can prevent packages from being tampered with in transit. NuGet signs all packages coming from it that live in its repository. And there are ways where authors can individually sign their packages so that you know it came from them and was hosted on our feed. There's not much you need to do there, except there are advanced policies where your organization can say, hey, I only want packages that come from, say, Microsoft or from publisher whomever, and you can lock that down if you want. How many folks are familiar with uh, CVEs and alerts, vulnerabilities? A few. I think this is something that we as developers all need to take a responsibility for. CVEs are the database and listing of vulnerabilities. Um, we're doing a better, we're adding more exposure to this in uh, Visual Studio and the CLI and making it possible to see these kinds of issues. So let's take a look here at um, the, uh, a common library. Suppose we want to add a zip compression to something. And we're going to add sharp ziplib, which is the very popular library to do. Um, wow, OK. Which is a very popular library to do um, compression on .NET. It recently had a vulnerability on uh, version 1.32, I believe. And it would be very easy to miss that if we weren't paying attention to it. So let's take a look at what this might look like. You know, project, we have this uh, package, no big deal. Um, we build it. And you know, there's no errors. No big deal, right? But Unbeknownst to us, there might be a pretty high vulnerability here. So there is a command uh, that you can run on the CLI and then also via Visual Studio that we can say um, the, um, that will show us the vulnerabilities. So let's see, package vulnerability demo. Where'd it go? I wanted. So if I run here, .NET list packages, it will show me here that, you know, here I'm running it with the dash dash vulnerable command, and it's going to tell me what the vulnerabilities are on this package, and say, hey, I might want to look at this, and see the details about it. Now, we're making additional work. We're taking on additional work to make this run automatically on restore. So you don't have to see this on a special command. If you're running this just on your CI, it should show up there too. But it also does show up in Visual Studio. So if I'm coming here and browsing my packages, and I'm seeing this, I might see this little yellow box. 
and I see a yellow triangle at the top. And if I click on it, it will tell me that same information. So if I update that to the latest version, it will go away. And you know we fix the problem. This information is also on NuGet.org. So we're trying to make this available to you every which way to try and make you more aware of these issues. We're also exposing a transitive vulnerability mechanism coming soon as well, where it's not just what are your first level dependencies, but the entire graph underneath that, if you have something vulnerable, let me know as well. So moving on. When it decides to draw the screen. <laughs> We're also taking steps to add support for uh, there we go. Uh, we're adding support for prefix reservations. So there is a feature on NuGet.org that we added sometime last summer, which allows you to request certain uh, contoso.something not be available to, say, the general public. Say, hey, look, we are a company. We're making stuff. We have packages with this name. Let's block that. And you can email us, and we will grant that request. The documentation is on our website for that. Um, and we have since enabled mandatory two-factor authentication for all accounts on NuGet.org. So this is something that was completed recently um, without much fanfare. But shouldn't be, because you're all using two-factor authentication today, right? So you already have it. Another feature that we have that is shipping right now in 17.2 is central package management. So this is a way where you can have the same dependency versions across your entire set of projects in, and specify them in one place. Prior to this, you might you know, be familiar, you add a project, and the version was in each project file. So now if you wanted to update those versions, you had to update them in each project file. Or some of you might have manually gone in to do fancy things with directory.build files and such. So we've gone ahead and productized a feature that many teams have been using internally for years. And so this is not new in any way uh, from a technology standpoint. It's just one where we've taken it and refined it and saying, we're going to ship this out to everybody else because this is something that everybody needs. So there's a new file here called directory.packages.props that contains packages and versions. And then later on, if you want to override them, say, look, I want to say, you know, in a particular project, maybe it's a test project, I want to use a different one, you can override and opt out and get something different. So you have flexibility there. Also enable you to turn on transitive pinning, and that will help lift the transitive versions higher so that you can get rid of the version downgrade prompts. How many folks here have seen that? You know, you've added a package, you get these weird warnings with like, hey, this, yeah, you, I don't think any of us have ever figured out how to really solve that. You know, so add this as a top level reference, right? And you're like, well, what? Turn on central package transitive pinning and all that goes away. The other thing too is that this works with all projects, including all your old legacy projects. It does need the latest MS build and tooling, but that can build the old stuff as well. So let's just take a very quick look here. And I think I have just one more roadmap slide at the end here, because we are coming up towards the top of the hour. Um, but we're going to come here and take a look at central package management. And here we're going to take a look at this uh, class library one. We can see here it's adding a reference to newtonsoft.json. But there's no version in here, because it doesn't need one. And the reason for that is that we've specified it here in this central location. So this project has a sent directory packages.props, and that will have the master list of all of your packages and versions. It's not saying that every project gets a reference to it. It's just saying, hey, if you do reference it, you use this version. Now. If I want to change that and say, hey, look, I don't want to use version 13 somewhere. I want to use, say, version 9. Maybe it's a test project and you need an explicit version. 
We can do that here. And if we come in and uh, look at transit of pinning, we can turn this on or off. And it's defaults to off. There was a 50-50 set of circumstances, whether some, you know, half the people liked it better defaulted with off, half the people liked it on, could not win this one. So I think it's best practice to turn it on, but you, you need to see what works for your project. What happens here is that if we were to add a reference just to version this project and have it bring in newtonsoft.json, it would have been version 12, but we want version 13, so we turn this feature on and we get that. And if these version numbers are all saying, hey, this is really confusing, um, we show this to you too. So if I come in here, I can come in and look at the packages, look at the version, and here in the UX, I see here it says version 13. And if I look here at the one with transitive pinning, it shows that here as well. Here's the first top level package. It's version, you know, one, whatever, that brings in newtonsoft.json 13 because we've turned this on. And now, if I turn this off, you'll see here, let me just turn this off. Here's the default behavior. If you don't enable it, it'll do run and restore. And you can see here, I don't know if you just saw that here, it popped up to version 12. Or popped down, because that's the default when you, the BSON library will pull that in, so it helps unify this uh, in a more central way. And here we have the version override. Um, if you look at the packages, I know it's small, but it, here it says version 9. So again, it all works. It shows it to you in the uh, Solution Explorer, so you're not guessing about what you're actually getting here. And that is, you do need the latest Visual Studio tools for that. 7.2 is in currently in preview. It will be released soon. Um, so we have that. Other things we have coming up, package scoring is one. A lot of people have asked, hey, there's a lot of packages out there. How do I know which one I should use? Give me a clue. Help me figure this out. So we're, we have a proposal out there on our GitHub repo. We're working on implementing this um, over the summer and fall to give you some indicators about package quality, security, velocity, and best practices. Uh, we will have a V1 you know, later this year, hopefully. We're also turning that package list into a machine-readable format. So instead of having to grep and grok and parse all these screens, we'll just let you skip that step and give you that output. The package source mapping tool that was in preview we will ship later, hopefully, you know, we'll more intelligence to it, so it groups more things. Uh, transitive dependencies are coming in the package manager UI in Visual Studio. So right now we've only seen you know, that in the Solution Explorer where I can drill down, but how do I know what packages are way down there even if I'm browsing in Visual Studio and I wanna see all this stuff? So we're gonna put that in there. Um, search by TFM, very popular ask, saying, hey look, I wanna look for a package, but I." Want to only, only show me results that are like compatible with this, what I can actually use here. So don't just return the world. So we're working on adding that um, as well. So that's coming. Uh, all of this is on GitHub. Our roadmap is there. Please, you know, chime in, uh, upvote things. We do very much look at upvotes on issues to help drive engagement and interest. And with that, I think we have just a few minutes for some additional questions, but I'll be around uh, later after this and you know this afternoon and definitely at the party this evening. Um, please tweet at the team, at me. We'll try and route your questions. Um, and yeah, so I don't know if there's any questions from the last few minutes, we we'll certainly take that. Yes. So the question is, what is the suggested baseline version to use? Is it 1.0 or the previous release? It really all depends on your scenario. What are you trying to compare against? Are you looking at the next major version? Or you know, what's the latest one you've shipped? So in, you know, for me, for example, I would probably look at, I've shipped 
you know, 47 because I'm using Git nerdbank versioning, and I never have a .0 shipping release that just doesn't exist. So I'll put 1.1.47 as the baseline and say, look, I'm working on 1.2 point whatever. Show me those differences. There is a way in the tools to say, look, suppose it is a known breaking change. You, there's an XML file, there's configuration, it's documented. You can acknowledge these changes and say, look, thank you for pointing that out. I'm good with that. Let's move on. So you can absolutely uh, say, you know, suppress certain warnings and errors that you know about. The question is, the um, package validation replace the public API analyzer. So I'm not 100% sure what the public API analyzer checks. I believe that was one for program compatibility against .NET Framework. OK, the question is, there just, it might generate a text file for comparison. Maybe, possibly. In this case, this is more programmatic, and this is built into the SDK itself. So there's no additional tooling to install either. So in the past, I mean, there have been other versions. There's a community project out there that there's several that can do these kinds of checks. You can compare them and do diffs. That's fine. There might work for your scenario. We wanted to ship one in the box so that it's there by default for everybody. Um, so that's what's there. We have those questions there. The link's not working. Um, I will fix that um, later. So I will we'll see why that's not working. It's the same DAC from Porto. Is there? Um, I will check and see why that's not working. Thank you. So the question is, um, is NerdBank versioning a best practice? Normally, the CI the build server does the versioning for me. Uh, the answer is 100% uh, yes. Um, as mentioned, the, one of the concerns about using versioning that comes from a build server is reproducibility. Something happens to that build server, it moves to a different build script. I can't, you know, you give it to somebody else that doesn't have your build server, they're not going to be able to just get that same exact binary without lots of additional work and guarantee that. So in looking to make sure that we can get the same binary every time just by running the build script, we're aiming for something that can be, you know, can work that way. So that last, that last answer you gave, was that about the reproducible build package or the version package? So the question is, is that the reproducible build package or the versioning package? Uh, yes. Um, so the answer is we want reproducible builds across. Reproducible builds helps ensure certain build settings are there uh, and compiler flags are automatically set for you, that symbols are generated and stored in the package. It's, that's documented on its page. Uh, it doesn't do anything for you about versioning. So versioning is you know, opinionated, the two different things, so you would need both in this case. And with that, um, I'll take one final question, and I think then we're at time. Um, for the vulnerabilities, um, I had a package, and I was importing to like N substitute, and I had dependency on system.tech.link expressions, and I had a vulnerability in it. Um, that never showed up on Visual Studio or, or anything like that. The only way I found about it was using a, a, a website called Snick, and that actually told me where it is. So I actually didn't realize it was vulnerabilities. So the question is, is there a, there was some package and substitute that contained a dependency that had a vulnerability. I believe that, and it didn't show up, uh, that believe that's coming as part of the transitive vulnerabilities work that's going to be surfaced. So right now, we would have shown you if and substitute was vulnerable, not any of its dependencies. So as transitive ones get surfaced, that should show up. Um, but please, you know, let me know, and I believe there's an issue to surface that, and we can, I can point you to that. That's coming very soon. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your conference, and you know, I'll see you all tonight at the party.